All right, guys, here we are with Sam at Common Folk Coffee, and we're gonna learn the art of making some coffee and some great coffee at that. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, so what's the first coffee that we are going to make today? Um, look, I reckon we make the uh, the Melbourne staple, which is the uh, the latte. Very good. Um, just I think it's what uh, just about 90% of the people are drinking. Okay. Um, and uh, we use our Godfather espresso blend, which is uh, perfect for milky coffees. All right, let's jump into the Godfather. Is really? this, this is one of your best selling coffees, right? Yeah, so the Godfather is probably our number one product. And, and I think the reason that's the case yeah. is because it makes a great latte and that's what people love drinking. Okay. And what are the types of beans that you use in the Godfather? Uh, so we've gone for, you know, a bit of an ode to the Italian roots of espresso in Melbourne. Um, and so we want to channel the old school smooth, chocolatey, nutty flavours, but with a bit of a specialty twist, you know, an elevated twist. And so we're looking for those flavours, which means we've chosen to go with uh, the coffees that make those things possible, uh, Brazil and Colombia. So Brazil gives you those nutty, uh, caramelly sort of flavours. Um, the Colombia elevates it a little bit, lots of body. Um, they're both really sweet, um, but not too acidic. Um, so a lot of specialty coffee is quite acidic. Right. Um, but in this case, we want it to be, you know, a little bit lower there so that it cuts through milk and doesn't taste like you're, you're drinking, I don't know, yogurt or something. Okay. So you where do these different regions of where you can get beans, do they all have different types of tastes? Yeah, for sure. Different, uh, different varieties of Arabica coffee, different regions of the world, different processing methods all lead to very, very different flavors. Um, and so in this particular circumstance, uh, the Brazil is a pulp natural, which means that it's um, uh, been allowed to uh, ferment a little bit further than uh, a wash coffee. And it's imparted some fermenty, earthy, kind of nutty flavors. Uh, and the Colombian's fully washed, which means it's a bit cleaner, um, but it's, uh, it's still got a lot of body and a lot of vibrancy to it. Um, and when they're blended together in, uh, in a particular ratio, I think it makes for a mean milky coffee. So okay. it's for you a latte now. Wonderful. So what is the process of actually making a coffee? Because there's terms of like tampering, grinding, what is the actual flow and the steps of actually making a coffee? Well, let's just say that we're making uh, a specialty coffee. Yeah. Um, and that we want to do it as uh, to best showcase the flavors of coffee. Um, you'll want to be grinding fresh every single time. Okay. So we do that at Common Folk, every coffee is ground fresh. Um, but then we take it to another level again. Um, we make sure that we weigh uh, the coffee that's going in okay. the shot of coffee. And how many, how much should it be in terms of weight? Uh, so with this particular coffee, we're using uh, pretty large dosing baskets, which I'll show you in a second. Right. Um, and we're using our 22 grams of coffee in. Okay. Um, which goes into here. Yeah. Um, into the basket. Uh, and then we want to make sure that it's really lovely and even. Okay. Um, and then we'll use the tamper to tamp the coffee down so that it's flat Yeah. Um, before we engage it into the group head, which is the part of the coffee machine. Okay. Put the handle into. Uh, and then uh, we weigh it again, the liquid coming out. Yeah. And so in this particular case, our ratio is uh, one to two. So the 22 grams of coffee in wants to yield 44 grams of liquid. Okay. So, uh, and then we can make two lattes. And look at the artwork on this, absolutely stunning. <laughs> yep, and that's all about the milk. And so oh, really? You use like a great local Jersey milk. Okay. Um, and when you're steaming the milk, um, the, the trick is to not actually overstretch. A lot of people think- What does that mean, overstretch? So um, that lovely foamy uh, microphone texture that you get on top of your latte or your flat white. Right. Um, that comes from um, putting uh, uh, I guess passing steam, which comes out of the steam head, yep. through the cold milk. Right. Um, and uh, it also can expand uh, the milk. And the trick is to not overstretch the milk and not to incorporate too much um, aeration. Um, because when you think about a latte, probably only the tiny top is actually stretched. But if you're steaming milk and it's foaming out the top, um. you're not going to have a nice consistency of bubble and it's not going to be nice and creamy when you drink the coffee. Um, and so you, yeah, you want to heat it up only to about 60-ish degrees, I like it, you know, on the warmer side, because if you overheat it, you basically end up drinking bechamel sauce, which I don't think anyone wants to do in coffee. <laughs> okay. um, and, it, and it best showcases the beautiful beans, which are the farmers have obviously invested a lot of time and energy into, as well as the roaster and the barista. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think most people, when they taste it, uh, appreciate the effort that went into it. So. All right, let's try this bad boy. It's actually not bad. <laughs> it's very smooth. It's very nice. Still got it. Um, Still got it, yeah. And so we're doing a range of coffees today. Yeah, let's uh, let's pull some espressos. I might do an I'll do a little espresso, and then I might do a uh, um, maybe a short macchiato. Yeah, that. done. And you've got some flavour saver. Oh yeah, on always. the on the mo. Yeah. No, that's right. Yeah, there we go. Just for later on. <laughs> so, 
what are the difference between a latte, a cappuccino? Um, are there various differences? I'm gonna let you in on a little bit of an industry secret. Right. That you can't tell anybody, <laughs> except for all the viewers. Yeah. Um, Although you could argue that a cappuccino um, probably should have more foam on it, right. traditionally. Um, and of course in Melbourne, we like to douse it with a whole heap of chocolate. Yeah. It's pretty tasty, chocolate and coffee go well together, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. Um, there's very, very little difference between a latte, a cappuccino and a flat white. Um, in fact, at Common Folk, um, we're only using ceramics because we think that's the best way to try coffee. Um, and you'll find that uh, there's actually no difference at all um, between our lattes and our flat whites, they're basically the same drink. Oh, right, okay. Um, and so uh, traditionally, maybe a latte was in a glass, um, but that's really the only difference. We still have customers who think that when they order a cappuccino, we press a cappuccino button on the machine. <laughs> right. Um, but our machines are as, as advanced as, I, as the internals are in terms of making sure that the temperature and the pressure is really, really on point. Um, the actual interface is even more basic than some old machines. Um, so we're pulling the same shot every single time because um, contrary to popular belief, um, it's actually consistency that makes your cappuccino taste just as delicious as your, um, as your dining partner's latte, rather than the fact that the two drinks are uniquely different. Okay. Um, and is there a big focus on the type of coffee machine that you buy? Yeah, for sure. I think in specialty coffee, which is the, I guess, the area of coffee that we like to operate in, which is focused on really showcasing um, the unique quality and, uh, and, and taste and uh, sensory experience of the bean. Um, we, we think that equipment's really important. You don't want to be working with poor equipment. So okay. a little espresso for you. Oh, very nice. Okay. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll be working with machines that are multi-boiler, which means that they have a separate boiler for extracting the coffee and pushing water through the group head and a separate one for the steam so that um, if you're steaming a lot of milk, it's not impacting uh, the way that the coffee is going to taste um, when it's being extracted because there's a consistency there. All right, very cool. Now, macchiato. So this is a macchiato and yep. this is an espresso. Yep. All right, I, and within the three, will they all taste different or? Yeah, very much so. So, um, and, and this is almost a spectrum of coffees. Um, probably the other one you could add in would be a long black, which is an espresso diluted with hot water. Yeah. Um, but you've got uh, straight black coffee, yeah. just the pure extraction. Um, it'll be pretty intense, um, quite strong yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in flavor. Yeah. Um, but interestingly enough, that shot is exactly the same shots we've used for the other coffees. We've just diluted them with milk. The, the macchiato is a very tiny amount of milk um, and the latte is a lot of milk. Okay. Yeah. And so it's two ingredients, well, three ingredients, water, coffee, milk. Yeah. Ooh, that's gonna get me through the day. Oh yeah. <laughs> now we are here in the beautiful Mornington. We're actually in your training center right now. You've got a roasting part. What are the different types of services that you offer here? So I guess we're a bit of a, you know, talk about vertical integration where there's a business that does a little bit of everything in their supply chain. Um, that's basically us. So it was all about great coffee initially. Um, I'm an addict. Yeah. And so that kind of really pushed me into the industry with a lot of passion and excitement because um, I basically wanted to be drinking the best coffees in the world myself. Right. <laughs> um, but I also wanted to be able to control the process um, in a bit more detail. Um, and so we uh, work with uh, farming partners and okay. producing partners in coffee uh, producing countries of the world um, to uh, develop uh, lots that we want to purchase and then we import them um, into our roastery. Uh, and then we roast that coffee so that we can showcase it in really one of three ways either on our own brew bars in our cafes, right. um, like we're doing here, um, or uh, to the retail user who can buy our coffee and then put it through their machine at home. Um, and then the major part of our business, which is to then work with and support restaurants and cafes who want to actually use a really great, ethically sourced, delicious coffee right. um, on their bars. Um, and that's why the training centers here, so that, uh, so that when their staff are, are kind of being onboarded to do things the common folk way, um, they can see it in person on our gear. Okay. Um, and hey, we even let the general public come in here as well and book a barista course so that they know how to produce common folk coffee the common folk way okay. on their machine at home. So. All right. And so you actually go overseas to actually source the beans? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so we'll travel uh, uh, to any of our major partner farms as often as we can. Um, we think that uh, in like any relationship you have with anyone, I think like, actually knowing the person super, super key. And so 
Um, we, we invest a lot of time and energy into the actual relationship with our farmers so that they understand who we are and we understand who they are. Yeah. Because not all coffee is created equal and a different producing group and a different, um, a different farmer might have very, very different needs to somebody else um, uh, on the other side of the globe. So we'll visit and we'll kind of try and get to know them individually, um, figure out what it is exactly they need uh, from us. Okay. Um, figure out whether or not we can you know, run some experiments with them or um, get different sorts of coffee. Right. Um, even how much we need to pay them for their coffee so that uh, it's viable for them to continue to exist because we want to buy from them year in, year out. Okay. Um, and, and yeah, so we'll travel around the world and, and, and taste coffees at the source. One of my fondest memories is sitting uh, uh, on the top of a mountain in Guatemala trying the coffee that the farmers have produced that we'd roasted oh, and then taking back yeah. to them in their traditional method as the sun kind of streamed through the window looking out over the coffee fields and um, it's really unique too because a lot of farmers don't drink their own coffee or don't regularly get to try what they produce really? um, because it's such an integral product for them to sell they want to sell all of it yeah now tell me how did common folk coffee start about because this is such an interesting story <laughs> well i wasn't always a, a, a barista i suppose um, in fact until i'd sort of you know, started uh, until I was well entrenched in my university degree, which was uh, the Bachelor of Science. I, yeah. I'm a, technically a zoologist. Um, I hadn't even really considered uh, coffee as being an industry that existed, let alone I would be a part of. Because um, what did you want to be? Because this is hilarious. Well, I'd had the dream um, when I was a kid. My, my childhood hero was David Attenborough. And so um, I, w I wanted to walk in Sir David's footsteps and, um, and become a naturalist or a zoologist and travel the world filming nature documentaries. So um, ironically, I probably traveled the world more than I could have expected yeah. <laughs> looking for coffee. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, but so I finished my degree, um, but while I was studying, of course, I was, um, I needed to pay my way through uni. And so I picked up a barista job, um, you know, so I could, you know, go out and drink beers um, and actually just fell in love with it. I love the, the product. I love drinking it. I love the interactions with customers. Yeah. Um, and I thought, you know what, I could actually really, really see myself giving this a crack. So yeah. when I finished my degree, I figured maybe I'll work in hospitality full time and if I'm still passionate about it, then yeah, I'll have a crack and maybe open up my own space. And how did it all start? What was the story behind it? Um, well, while I was working in hospo, seeing if I could hack hospo life, yeah. um, a couple of my good friends who were a little bit older and had a bit more experience in, in a more corporate world um, actually found out about my idea for opening up a, a cafe roasting space. and. And we're like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll back it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so we kind of got to work putting together a business plan um, and thought about maybe what we wanted it to look like, um, you know, how we'd be led as a business, what would what would value and what we wouldn't, right. what we'd try and do. Um, and then once we'd figured out um, exactly, you know, what Common Folk was going to be um, and came up with a name, yeah. um, it was kind of getting down to work, trying to find a location. So, um, but we were really, really keen, I guess, from the very beginning to not just be another cafe or another roasting business, but to try and do things the common folk way. All right, so we are now going to jump to the next segment where we're going to learn everything around roasting and coffee.